and at the feet of Jesus. So, Father, we thank you, Lord, that you have joined us here, Father. We're not here in vain, but we have great expectation of reward for being here tonight. We open our hearts, Lord, and we just purpose to hear from heaven tonight, to live out your plans in the earth. We set our heart, we set our mind, we set our affections on what you have for us, Lord. There's a vision that you have for us as a people that you have been revealing to us and directing us and how to walk in. And we just set our hearts to, to follow you and all that you have for us, Lord. To, to not uh, leave one thing on the table that you have purposed for us. We just set our hearts, Lord, to just possess our inheritance in its fullness. And we know it comes by the revealing of your word. So we just yield and give way to the Holy Spirit tonight. We thank you for utterance tonight. We thank you, Lord, for just bearing each of us witness that this is your word we're hearing and not something that a man came up with. And as a result, Lord, you are faithful to confirm it in our lives, Father, with signs and and with wonders following. And we give you all the praise for it. In the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Let's open our Bibles tonight to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. And this will be part three. Volume two. Of embracing God's vision. For a debt free life. Embracing God's vision for a debt-free life. And as I shared last Wednesday and Sunday, the Lord just corrected me of just to slow down concerning um, his vision for us, living a debt-free life of abundance. Um, this is what the Lord has for us. This is what he has purposed for us. This is his will for us. And though in our thinking, when we look at where we are in the natural, where we are uh, financially, in terms of uh, what we have coming in, in terms of the financial responsibilities and obligations we have, what's going out, it may seem, uh, and more likely does seem, to the natural carnal mind that this is just a thing that's too hard that it will never be. And so what we have to realize is, is that we are, we're not a natural people. We're spiritual people. Over in, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, it talks about, it makes a distinction between the natural man and the spiritual man. And it talks about how because we are spiritual and not natural, it has been given to us the spirit of God so we can know the things that have been provided for us. And you need to know that a debt-free life of abundance has been provided for each of us. Amen. Amen. And I'm just wondering, is there something about that back row that's so attractive? It's the most people I've seen ever on that back row. I really appreciate it. Y'all fill in from the front as we move forward. There's a purpose for that. Um, but in any event, we're not natural people. We're spiritual. And we have to, we have to, um, we have to be deliberate and intentional to live out of our spirit man as opposed to the natural carnal man. Are y'all following what I'm saying? Are you? We, we've been conditioned to think, to act, to speak in a particular way. And that way or that manner is contrary to God's word and God's way. Um, and so the things that, that God is, is showing us from his word, the natural man or the carnally minded man will not be able to receive them. But if we'll purpose to be spiritual minded, spiritually minded, word of God minded, and, and understand that, hey, with man, there are going to be a lot of things that are impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Amen? Amen? Do we agree with that? That's what the word says, right? All things are possible with God, amen? amen? So each of us living a debt-free life of abundance is possible through God. Amen? amen. Hallelujah. And, and listen, this, 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 this is where he's, he's endeavoring to, to bring us to this place in our understanding. And so as I share it with you, have you found Luke chapter 12? I share it with you that, that in the instructions... Uh, to lead us to that place of debt-free living, it involves moving from a place of covenantousness to a place 
of covenant, from a place of covetousness to a place of covenant. Or we could say, um, and, and if I could put it in the form of a, of a, of a, of a command or a mandate, uh, which is actually a, a statement I want to make to you, but it's, it's more than a statement. It's, it's, it's actually a command, I believe, from the Spirit of God, and that is this, stop toiling and trust in the blessing. Stop toiling and trust in the blessing. We need, that, that, that's not something that's going to happen uh, casually, but that happens as we are intentional in making that decision. Amen? That is a decision that each of us must make that I am going to stop toiling and I'm going to start trusting in the blessing. Amen? Amen. Glory to God. So if you found Luke chapter uh, 12, um, I've, I've alluded to this, referenced this many times, uh, but I just want us to put our eyes on it just for a moment here. Um, beginning at verse 15, Jesus is speaking to the people in, result, in response to, to, to a question that he's asked. He's basically, he has a guy come to him and wants him to make his brother divide his inheritance uh, among the two of them. And, and Jesus is, is, is begins a teaching as a result of this, this uh, encounter with this, with this guy. In verse 15, he says to them, take heed, take heed and beware of covetousness. See, and the reason he's, he's admonishing us to take heed and be aware of it is because it's, it exists and it's prevalent. To be covetous minded is the easiest thing in the world because we are, we are taught that and conditioned that um, day one. It's, it's, a, it's, a natural, uh, it's a natural inclination, if you will. You, you take a child, a baby, uh, a toddler, um, and, and, and you, you set two of them in the room and let one of them have a toy and the other one doesn't. The one with it, without it, is going to reach out to the one that has it because he wants that toy. And, 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 and it just goes from there. We, we tend to want... Um, what we see others with. It, 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 it just starts from day one. And so we're conditioned to think that way, to act that way. Um, and even as we mature a little bit and, and begin to understand that, hey, no, that belongs to that person. That's not mine. Um, we, we, we got enough. We, we come to a place of maturity where we say, no, okay, I can get my own. You have yours and I can get my own. But, but for the believer, we've got, to, we've got to realize that anything we have in our possession is not our own. The only reason we have what we have is because God provided it. He gave it to us. And you remember the, the parable that Jesus was speaking about, the, the, the ruler who gathered together uh, his servants, and he divided to one five talents, another two talents, one one talent, according to their ability. And, 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 and he says now, he says, occupy till I come. In other words, you take what I've given you and do business with it and, and, and increase it for me when I return. So, so, so each servant was to do business with what they had received from their master. It wasn't theirs to do with as they chose. They were simply to steward it. Are you following what I'm saying? And everything God has entrusted to our charge, everything we have in our possession, we got it from God. And so with that comes the responsibility of stewardship. We're to manage it or steward it on behalf of our Father. So from that standpoint, anything we have, even though it's in our possession, it's not, we don't have ownership rights and privileges over it the way God does, because he gave it to us to steward or to use in his interest. Are y'all following what I'm saying? Your, your very purpose for being here in the earth, even though each and every one of us have goals, we have desires, we have aspirations, things we want to do, things we want to accomplish, things we want to achieve. And a lot of our consciousness is, is geared around how to make that happen. 
We're not in the earth for the things that we're mindful of or the things that we have as personal goals and desires. We're in the earth on behalf of the Father and on behalf of the welfare and the well-being of everybody else that's in the earth. We're here to be a blessing to the families of the earth. And while we are, are, are seeking the pursuit and the accomplishment of the things God has put in our heart, we have to understand it's, it's, it's not just for our sole benefit, but for the benefit of those that we will encounter or whose paths we will intersect with, the, the paths of others that, that, that our lives will intersect with. We're here in the earth to, to have an impact on the, work, on the lives of those we interact with. Are y'all following what I'm saying? So God has blessed us with whatever we have as a possession and his desires that we yielded to him and stewarded over him and serve his interests and by that be a blessing so that he through us can express himself to others. And at the same time that we yield and allow him to express himself through us to others, he's talking to others to express the, himself through them to us. Are y'all following what I'm saying? And so this is why we need to be aware of and we need to be on guard of becoming covenantous minded, of thinking that what we have in our possessions is ours to do with as we please. When the reality is that God has provided it for us to steward it, to be stewards over it, and to serve him with all that we have and all that we are. Are y'all following me? So we got to own it. We got to realize, you know, I'm not in the earth. Me, I'm in the earth for so many others than just myself. Are y'all following me? That, that's why Satan is not, he's not, um, he's he not worried about a believer dying and going to heaven. He just wants the believer out of the earth realm. Because as long as a believer is in the earth realm, that believer has potential influence. That believer has the potential to have an impact on life in the earth. And he wants us out of the earth. He wants anyone who, who, who would be a vessel through whom God could use. He wants us out the earth. He wants us out the way. Now, if he can't get us out the earth to, to keep us from, from, from having influence and, and having an impact, he tries to make us covenant just minded and just think about us and no more. Are y'all following me? So, 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 so Jesus is telling us, beware of this. Take heed, listen to what I'm saying, beware. He says this, for a man's life consists if not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. I like to say it this way. A man's welfare, a man's well-being, a man's security in life is not, it doesn't, it, it's, it's not in what he has or what he possesses. And a lot of us, we're conditioned by the world the wisdom of a fallen man, a system that's self-serving, we're, we're conditioned by that world system to think that the more I have, the better off I am. We're conditioned to think, well, I got this, so let me stick my chest out. Because when I look over here at somebody else, they don't have what I have, so I must be better than them. I must be doing better than them. And so we, we, we tend to attach our self-worth uh, our self-esteem to what we have in our hand. And Jesus is saying, no, your life does not consist in the abundance of the things you possess. So, so are you following me? So that cannot be the drive and the motive by which we go about life just to accumulate stuff. Are you following me? So he, he goes on to say, uh, in, in, in the form of a parable, he says, the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, see, here's the covetousness in it. He thought within himself saying, what shall I do because I have no room where to bestow my fruit? So this man, this, this, this man uh, is either, this would, uh, this would be apl applicable to a person who is either not a believer, not a Christian, or someone who has no working knowledge of his covenant and therefore he's carnally minded because he's thinking only of himself. Notice he's not even asking God He's not inquiring of the Lord about the situation, about a resolution. He's thinking within himself. He's looking to his own individual wisdom and ideas of what's right and what's wrong. Are you following me? Y'all see what I'm saying? So, so, so that's, that's, that we can't live like that because, because um, 
that, that, to live in that manner, to leave God out, to leave God out of the equation, to not have any regard for what he has to say or what he wants, uh, is, is to live void of his power and his might. Are you following me? Is everybody all right? Okay, praise God. All right, so now, so he goes on to say, he says, I thought within myself, saying, for shall I do? Okay, verse, verse, verse 18, and he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. So again, he's not thinking about the goodness of others. He's not thinking about how he can help somebody be a blessing. He just thinks, well, well, I got this problem. I got more stuff than I got room. What am I going to do? Oh, I know. I'll just make more room. Are you following? All right. So he, go, he, he, he goes on to say, uh, verse 19, and then, now, now, he says, and I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Now, what's wrong with that? What, what, what's wrong with the state or the reality of, of having abundance that, that you can sit back and take your ease? Nothing. Nothing wrong, anywhere wrong with that. Your covenant with God, my covenant with God, gives us access to everything God is and everything God has for such a life. But the problem here is that he has sought to do this for himself independent of God without regard for God or without regard for others. So, so he has labored, he has toiled, he has done whatever he's done. And, and you know, when, you, when you start examining uh, people um, uh, that, that have a lot, uh, uh, I don't, don't want to say it like that. When you start looking into, um, you, 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 you tend to find where people cut corners and they compromise and they maybe cheated here, they cheated there. Because after all, if, it ain't got, if I have no regard for God and I have no regard for others, what's, what, what is there to... What is there to motivate me to, to be a person of integrity? I don't care nothing about you. So why should, I be, why should I act in integrity? I don't care nothing about God. Why should I act in integrity? What within me is going to compel me to be a person of integrity if I have no regard for God? Nothing. It's all about me and what I can get. And if I got to cut your throat to get it, so be it. That, that's, that's what we're talking about. Y'all follow what I'm saying? Uh, that's, that's, that's what we're talking about. So be aware of that. And, because, see, when we get to that point where we're willing to do whatever to get it because we think by having it we're better off, now we have developed the wrong relationship with the stuff. There's nothing wrong with having the stuff. It's the way we relate to it. It's the love and the regard we have for it. And, and the love, the trust, the dependency that we place in money and stuff is at the root of all evil. So there's nothing wrong with having abundance. God desires that we all have abundance, but he does not desire that the, that, that the, the abundance have us. We're not to worship uh, what he provides. We're to worship the provider with what he's providing. Are y'all following what I'm saying? So we're to use it to, the, to building up his kingdom and service in his interests. And in the process of that, by putting him first, he says, I'll just keep adding to what you got. Are y'all following me? And so when you do it his way, there's no sorrow attached to it. Glory to God. So now look at verse 20. And God said to him, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall thee, those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. So in this one sentence, you could say it this way. So is he that is rich towards himself and layeth up not treasure for God. To lay up treasure for himself is equivalent to being rich towards self. So he's saying here, he's pointing out to us that every person whose primary motive in life is to get all he can get instead of having the motive, having the primary motive, how can I serve you, God? 
The person whose primary motive in life is to serve self as opposed to serving God is a person who is operating in a covenantous mindset. Are y'all following me? So that, this, this person then, what, we, what we've got to realize is we've got to make the connection. We've got to connect the dots. The, the, covenant just, the, co- the person who is covenantous minded um, is the prideful person. It's the proudful person. He, this is the person who thinks more highly of his own ideas, his own opinions, his own views, his own ways. In other words, this is the person who said, well, that's just stupid. That, that don't make sense to me. I'm going to do this. So he takes the this that, he, that, that makes sense to him and exalts it above what God says in his word. That's a prideful person. And the Bible says pride goes before a fall. Why? Because the prideful person, the person that exalts his opinions, his values, his practices above God's word, the Bible said God resists him. In other words, God takes his pride has, 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 has he, in, in, in putting his own ideas above God's word, he has taken a position in opposition to the position that God has taken. And the fact that God is resistant to the pride, he resists the pride, then, then so, 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 uh, the person, the prideful person that thinks more highly of what he believes and how he sees things than he does God's word, that person has, has taken a position and is, and is traveling a path uh, in, 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 in the complete opposite direction of what God desires for. So not only are they not walking in the direction God has for them, they're going in a completely different direction, but then God, because he resists the proud, he's going to take a position even in opposition to the position they're now taking. And they, not, they, they won't make progress in trying to go it, do, it, do it their way. Oh, man, I, I don't know if I said that. Y'all get what I'm saying? So, 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 so because God resists the proud, we could say this. God is resistant to the covenant just minded person, carnally minded person. So the covenant just minded person, the person who is in pursuit of everything he can get with no regard for God or others, only what he can do and get for himself. That's a covenant just minded person, a carnally minded person. And that person will meet with an end that is not going to be well. You can find that in Psalm 73. I think it's Psalm 73 where it talks about that. Talks about makes the distinction between those who prosper in the world and those who prosper God's way. There's a big distinction about that. Are you following me? Now, that person is going to appear a lot of times to be well off and prosperous by the standards that the world uses as prosperity. However, when you look at it from God's perspective, how much peace can a person have? When the, when, 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 when the source of their trust is in what they possess as opposed to the living God. Are you understand what I'm saying? Be- because, because, see, at, at some point along the way, everybody encounters opposition from the enemy. Everybody encounters testings, trials, tribulations, temptations, all that kind of stuff. We encounter storms of life, if you will. We will encounter the enemy trying to oppose us, right? Now, if all I got going for me is what I've managed to get my hands on, all Satan has to do is just create or manipulate a problem that's just a little bit outside my reach, just a little bit more than what I got in my hand, just a little bit more beyond my understanding, and and boom, he got me. But on the other hand, if I'm in covenant with God, see, the thing with the covenant with God, the person who is in covenant with God is far richer than the person who, who maybe got nine figures in his bank account. Here's why. The person with the nine figures in his bank account, that's all he got. The person with the covenant with God has access to all God has. 
whether, whether at that ever transforms or translates into the nine figures in my account or not, it will translate into me having everything my heart's desire, doing everything God called me to do without toil or sorrow and enjoying peace in the process. Are y'all following what I'm saying? See, see, the believer doesn't, one of the reasons it's not all in our account at the same time, first of all, it doesn't need to be in our earthly account, all of it at the same time. You just need, need to know how to access it from your heavenly account when you need it. Another reason, whatever is manifested in the earth realm is now subject to, the, to whatever aspects of the curse are presently manifesting in the earth realm. That's why Jesus is saying, don't lay it up, don't let your treasures in the earth. You got moths and corruption can get at it, but lay it up in heaven. He's not saying wait till you, heaven, wait till you get to heaven to get it. He's talking about the, the, the crediting that God does with your account when he sees your obedience in the earth. That you can, we, we, we won't get into that tonight, but that's over there in Philippians 4.15. Um, where, where when God sees you being willing and obedient with what you have, and you being liberal and generous up in, in your heart and your soul towards others, uh, he credits your account, your heavenly account. It, the, the Amplified Classic says it, it, it begins to accumulate with blessings. So, so I believe it this way. Whenever you are willing and obedient in your, with, in your service to God with what's in your hand, there are certain, I personally, this is my opinion now, I believe that there are certain uh, resources, um, properties, finances, whatever you place a value on, as it is in the earth, certain aspects, certain dimensions, certain portions of that become allotted to you as yours from God's perspective. And as you continue to walk with him, the, the, he, he guides and directs you in appropriating those things and having those things as your possession. Y'all follow what I'm saying? Amen. So y'all got, got to stay with me, man, because see, this, this, this is God, God's trying to do something. When I say trying to do, uh, God doesn't try. God, God, it, God doesn't try and fail. You follow what I'm saying? God is endeavoring to do this, and, and, the, and the only way he cannot do it is if we don't cooperate with it. So that would be an individual uh, thing. Are you following me? So, 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 so when we talk about moving from a place of covetousness to a place of covenant, we're talking about moving from a system of, of toiling uh, and, and, and living off self-effort to a system of blessing. Uh, God's system, God's way of doing things is designed, it's, 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 it's empowered, if you will, or sustained. Uh, it works by the power of God, which is the blessing. We can refer to it as the anointing. Uh, and, 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 and it yields and produces blessings. So, so, so God is, is endeavoring to move us from a place of toiling uh, trusting and toiling, a system of toiling, to a system of blessing. But before he can take us to a system of blessing, he has to take us to a mindset of covenant. See, toiling is a result of a covenant just mindset. So I've got to have a change in my mindset to become covenant-minded in order to, to live and trust in God's system of blessing. Y'all see how that work? All right, so, so now look, look at, look at, look at, so, so he, he's, he's trying, to, a, a system of blessing uh, is, it's, it's, it's a system, it's a way of living that's based on covenant with God, covenant promises that he has made us, uh, covenant demands that he has given us um, and to the, de to the degree that we play our part, we get the benefit of his faithfulness in his part. Are y'all following what I'm saying? He over in Deuteronomy, he said, uh, hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord your God. He says, if you do that, he says, all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you. 
if you hearken diligently to the voice of the Lord God, God. Isaiah 1 and 19, he says, if you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. So that's an if, right? I think it's in Job 36, 11, uh, somewhere right there, maybe it might be 11, 36, but it says, if you obey and serve him, you'll spend your days in prosperity and your years in pleasure. But, but, there's a, but, but don't, don't just skip past the if. That's not automatic. That's predicated on us doing our part. That's predicated on us abandoning this system of toil and self-effort and embracing God's system of blessing and living off of his faithfulness as opposed to our toil and self-effort. We live off of his faithfulness. The faithfulness of, of that, that, that is a result of us keeping his word of serving his interests. Are y'all following what I'm saying? So, 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 look at Proverbs chapter 3. Just pull up Proverbs 3 for me, verse 5, and, 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 and we'll just go straight to the message translation uh, for the sake of time. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, you're familiar with it, you know, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not to your own understanding, and all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. But in, but in that message translation, it says, trust God from the bottom of your heart. Don't try to figure out everything on your own. Next verse. Listen for God's voice in everything you do, everywhere you go. He's the one who will keep you on track. Now, years ago, just... just um, um, Go ahead and put it in the, in, the, in the King James for me, verse 5. Before I knew anything about the message translation, God gave me this verse years ago. Trust the Lord with all thine heart, lean not to thine own six. In all thy ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. So, so years ago, I remember I was in my den, and I was just in prayer about some things, and I was asking the Lord, what? What, man, what's the key? What, what's the key in, in walking this out and in, 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 in getting this right? Doing, doing. And he gave me those verses right there. Those verses right there. It, now, 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 one more time, amp, uh, message, verse 5, message. But now, now, now just look at it again in the message translation. Trust God from the bottom of your heart. Don't try to figure out everything on your own. That, that's it right there. The person who insists on trying to figure out everything on his own, why does he do that? Because he's not trusting God. Because he's not covenant-minded. He's covenant-just-minded. Are you following what I'm saying? So he is, he is intentional and deliberate in trying to figure it out and trying to see what makes the most sense. And that's what I'm going to go with. All right? Verse 6 in the message. Listen for God's voice in everything you do. In every way you go, listen. Because see, you're not, we, we're, we're, we're either, oftentimes we may hear, but we won't recognize. But if you're listening for his voice, that with the intent to live by what you hear, that creates a whole nother level of sensitivity. That helps you to more readily, more easily discern and distinguish the voice of the Lord, the good shepherd, from that of the stranger when he does speak. And he says, why do that? Because he's the one that will keep you on track. Don't trust in your ability to figure stuff out and work stuff out to keep you on track. No, got, Satan got some stuff out there. See, that's all he wants is to keep us in this realm of, 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 of sense knowledge and reasoning because he's a master of that. He's, he's a master of manipulating uh, data that we take in through the senses. He's a master of manipulating uh, what we find reasonable. And so you can't trust your own understanding. So stop trying to figure it out. Stop leaning upon your own understanding and just trust God from the bottom of your heart. I mean, think about it. Every person in here, we, everybody in here believers, right? We all saved, right? Nobody in here not a believer, right? So as a believer, somebody just raise your hand or, or just blurt it out loud. As a believer, what is the hope that you have once you leave that, that body you're in? What hope do you have what, what is your expectation for, for where you are, where you end up once you leave your body? 
Say what? Be with Jesus. Somebody else? Be with Jesus. Okay, what is it based on? What, what is that hope based on? Huh? How you live and how you live is based on? The, the word, right? So you mean to tell me I can trust Jesus with my soul, but I can't trust him with my seat? I'm expecting to spend eternity with Jesus. I've entrusted the welfare and the well-being of my soul on, on the word, but I can't trust my welfare and well-being to him in the earth. I, I'm trusting him for where I'm going to be once I leave, but I can't trust him while I'm here. That's 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 foolishness. That's that's the wisdom of this world. That's the, that's 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 Satan. So if I can trust him with my soul, how much more should I be able? Should I trust him with my everything else? Are you following what I'm saying? So, so, so that's got to be intentional and deliberate where we trust him from the bottom of our hearts. We don't try to figure out everything on our own. We listen for God's voice in everything we do and everywhere we go. And we depend on him to keep us on track on the right track in our thoughts, on the right track in our beliefs, on the right track. Now that track that he got ain't gonna make sense all the time. There are, there are a few times will it make sense. But, but it, it'll, 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 it'll become familiar as you, you get accustomed to following the Lord. Uh, but, but God is going to continue to lead and guide us beyond even what we're familiar with. Once he's, he's able to, uh, once, once we come up in a place of n knowing his love for us and trusting his love, where I trust him on this level, we're not going to be at that level long. He's looking to take you to another level, and, and that's beyond the current level that you're accustomed to trusting him on. And so now you have to be willing to trust him on the, the higher level, the next level. Are y'all following what I'm saying? And to whatever level... We decide, you know what, I, I don't know about that. I, uh, no, I, I, man. Well, that's it. That's, that's as far as we go. As far as we go. But, 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 the, uh, but, the, but the, the danger also in that, not only is that as far as we go, we don't stay on that level. We start digressing and slipping backwards. Why? Because we have an enemy to our faith. And so the moment I refuse to trust him beyond what I'm accustomed to, I stop moving forward, but I'm not, not only do I stop moving forward, but I can't even maintain the ground I have because the moment I stopped trusting God, I started trusting Satan. Now, I may not do it consciously, but I exalted my opinion and my beliefs and my values above what the truth God was trying to tell me. And so now I'm prideful. Now God is resisting me. Now, I, now, now I, when I stop following God, Inevitably, I started following Satan. That's it. There ain't no in between. Y'all follow what I'm saying? So, so, so what's happening is, oh, thank you, Lord. Go to John 16. John 16, 13 in the, in the Amplified Classic. So the whole point of choosing to trust God from the bottom of our heart with all our being. The whole point of choosing to listen for his voice in everything we do and everywhere we go and not try to figure it out on our, set, on our, on our own is because the message says he'll keep us on track. The, the King James says he'll, he'll direct our paths. The whole point of that is to know the truth about our every situation that we're facing. Go, go ahead. Um, yeah. And he, the spirit of truth, the truth given spirit comes. He will guide you into all the truth. The whole full truth. For he will not speak his own message on his own authority. But he will tell whatever he hears from the father. So you and I have direct access to, to the words of the Father through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He will give the message that has been given to him. So whatever situation you find yourself in, God has something to say about it. And it's through the Holy Spirit 
inside of us that we're going to hear what he has to say about. He has something to say about every situation we're dealing with, every situation we'll ever deal with. He has something to say about it. He, and what he has to say about it is the truth. It's the truth. Not only is it the truth, but it's the what you do about it. It's the truth about what it actually is, but it's also the what and the how to proceed forward. You follow me? He will tell whatever he hears from the Father. He will give the message that has been given to him, and he will announce and declare to you the things that are to come that will happen in the future. He will give the message that has been declared to him, and he will announce and declare to you the things that are to come, things that will happen in the future. So the whole point of trusting in, in the Lord and leaning not to our own understanding, but trusting in him, the whole point of acknowledging him in all our ways and getting is, is because we have a promise that he'll direct our paths. And we see from this verse in verse 13 that he's going to direct us or guide us into all truth. He's going to reveal to us the truth about whatever we're dealing with, whatever it consists of, but also he's going to reveal to us the answer, the what to and the how to to proceed forward. Y'all follow me? Give me, give me verse uh, 14 in the, in the Amplified Classic. He will honor and glorify me because he will take of, he will receive and draw upon what is mine and will reveal. He's going to draw upon what is mine and he's going to reveal, he's going to declare, he's going to disclose, he's going to transmit it to you. You, you see that? Everything, now, now, now go, go ahead to verse 15. Everything that the Father has is mine. This is Jesus talking. That's what I meant when I said that, the, that he, the Spirit, will take the things that are mine and reveal, declare, disclose, and transmit it to you. So everything that the Father has belongs to Jesus. We agree? We are joint heirs along with Jesus. Agree? So everything that the Father has belongs to us. Agree? And the Holy Spirit job is to reveal to us what belongs to us, right? The answers that belong to us, the wisdom that belongs to us, the what to, the how to, the protect, whatever is necessary for you and for me to, to, to live out the plan of God, the Holy Spirit's job is to reveal it and help us do it, Right? He, he was, listen, he knows all about the Father's plans and purposes for each one of us. The stuff you can't find, you know, I can't go to 1 Todd chapter 2 verse 1 and say do this on this day at 7 o'clock in the pit, but the Holy Spirit can direct me. Every decision that you need to make in order to move from where you currently are to the place God has for you, the Holy Spirit reveals to you. Each decision guides and directs you in each decision. Are you understand what I'm saying? No, but, but see, that's covenant. That's covenant. That's, that's, that's embracing the system of blessing and living in covenant with God as opposed to being covenantous minded and living from a system of self-effort and toil. You got what I'm saying? And we know from John 14, you don't have to turn there, but, but we know from John 14 that Jesus... He said this in verse 15. He says, if you love me, you, you, you'll keep my commandments. And then he gets on down there in verse 21, and he talks about manifesting uh, himself. Right? He says, he says Th those that love me uh, will be loved by my father. And my father and I, we will come and we will manifest ourselves to him. Right? Verse 23 talks about how he, he's going to come in and, and dwell with us. Right? So, so when you have, listen now. You can't get more prosperous than having Jesus and the Father manifesting themselves to you. You can't get more. When, when, when the Lord is manifesting his goodness on your behalf, that is true prosperity. You cannot get more prosperous than that. But, but now... What is the key to being in that place to have him manifest ourselves, himself to being covenant minded? Acknowledging that everything I have in my possession belongs to him anyway. Mm -hmm. 
including me. The very life that I am is not mine, but his. And so, so I got to be real about really, truly turning the welfare and well-being of my life over to him as opposed to trying to take care of me myself. And, and in order for me to really do that, I got to know him. In order for me to know him, see, see I, I got to trust him. And in order to trust him, I got to know him. In order to know him, I got I to gotta make time to commune with him and fellowship with him. I have to make time. I can't, if I want to know him, I can't just say, oh, well, you know, I'll catch up with the Lord later. You know how some people are like, man, yo, man, give me a call. Yeah, yeah, we'll do lunch. That, man, you know, that ain't going to never happen. Yeah, all right, I get up, okay, and you probably will, but it's nothing you're intentional about. It, that happens, you know, when maybe when you drive home, you got some time, and you, somebody across your mind, you bored, and you're like, oh, yeah, let me call so-and-so. I ain't doing nothing. It's convenient. God don't play that role. Amen. He doesn't play that convenient game. Because there's no honor and there's no worship towards the Lord when we just spend time with him as it's convenient to us. The honor and the regard, the worship comes when we're intentional and deliberate when he's first. And everything else must adjust to him being first. Our lives should, what's the word, evolve, revolve. Jesus should be at the very center of, of our lives. Our, our daily fellowship and communion with him is at the top of the list. And as a result, everything going on in our lives should, should revolve around Jesus as the center point. Not everything, everything going and we just maybe fit Jesus in when I can. Y'all follow what I'm saying? I mean, think about it, think about it, think about it. How many of y'all, how many of y'all remember back in the day when, you know, when you, you know, you thought you was cute and everything, and you was out there dating and, and carrying on, all that kind of stuff, and... And anybody can remember that? Nobody? Just a few. Okay, thank you, Elaine. Got it. Thank you. All right, so, 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 so you remember, you know how you play them games? Somebody show a little interest. You show them enough interest to keep them coming, but you don't show them so much to make them think you got you, they got you. Well, Y'all remember that? So, so if you felt, you, if, in, in, in other words, in other words, in other words, you played them games until finally you met somebody that, 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 that got to you enough to where you was willing to put the games aside. And then they became your sole pursuit. You were intentional. You were deliberate. You follow what I'm saying? You clear your, you clear your calendar. I remember my cousin, we used to do a lot of hanging out and stuff, and, and then my wife and I, we was dating, um, and, and it get, looked like every time he calling me like man nah I'm, I'm going out with Trish man you want up nah I'm going out with Trish so so you know what he did instead of calling me up and said look man what you doing he would call me up and said you going on your pup run no he said you going on your pup route I said pup route I ain't got no puppies he said no pick up Patricia you going on your pup route so he knew we should be that intentional with God that, that people ought to know there's certain that they, they, they ought to they they ought to know when they come at you your response to them is going to be by God from what you get from God you understand and 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 so so that means he's he's got to be Time with him, has, we, we've got to see just how critical that is. And so you can't do that being prideful. That requires humility. That requires humility. Are you following what I'm saying? So, so I, okay, I got to skip a little something here. So let's go to, go to, go to 1 Peter 5. Go to 1 Peter 5. Are you there? All right, now, now, now let, me, let, me, let, me, let me read a, a little bit to you and make this statement. The key, then, to actually moving from covetousness to covenant uh, is to recognize that our welfare or our well-being 
is no longer our care. If I want to move to that place of covetedness, uh, that place of covenant with God, that place of blessing, I've got to recognize that my well-being is no longer my care, but it's God's care. I've got to recognize that. I've got to, I've got to trust my life to God. I've got to realize that, no, I am not responsible for me. God is. And I've got to turn everything over to his care. You follow me? Now, so here's a statement that I want to give you. Humbling ourselves before God is critical to being exalted by God. Humbling ourselves before God is critical to our being exalted by God. That, that probably, I should have probably said, to critical to us being exalted by God. But you get the point, right? So, so now look at, let's look at verse number um, Let's look at verse number six, King James. Um, and, and, yeah, thank you. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. What are we talking about? We're talking about humility, right? Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. So in order to be exalted by God, uh, uh, Humility is essential. Humbling ourselves is actually critical to us being exalted by God. It doesn't happen uh, without us humbling ourselves. It doesn't happen without a lifestyle of humility. Now, this word exalt, it means to, one of the meanings of this word exalt, it means to raise to the summit, the summit of opulence and prosperity. The summit means the highest point. So to be exalted is for God to raise us up to the highest point, the summit of, of, of opulence. Opulence has to do with great wealth, having great wealth and abundance. So to, so to be exalted is to be raised to the highest point of opulence and prosperity, to the very tip-top pinnacle. Are you following what I'm saying? Y'all with me? He, now, 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 who's going to do that? Who's going who's to exalt us? According to that verse, who? God, right? God is going to exalt us. But, it, but, but now, what is it that allows God or authorizes God to exalt us? Humbling ourselves, right? Right? So, so how do we humble ourselves? Verse 7 tells us. We humble ourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt us in due time. How? By casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. The, the Amplified Classic, verse 7, um, well, look, 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 at, look at verse 6. We'll start at verse 6 and 7 in the Amplified Classic. Verse 6 says, Therefore, humble yourselves, demote, lower yourselves in your own estimation under the mighty hand of God, that in due time he may exalt you. Casting, casting, Casting the whole of your care, all your anxieties, all your worries, all your concerns, once and for all, on him. For he cares for you affectionately and cares about you watchfully. So, 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 so humbling ourselves before God is critical to us being exalted by God. And, and what do I mean by being exalted by God? We're talking about being raised to the summit of opulence and prosperity. Is that not a status change for you or what? We can say this then. The key to moving from wherever we are presently in our finances to a, to a, life, to a debt-free life of abundance is what? Humility. Humbling ourselves right before God. What does that mean? Casting all of our cares, our anxieties, our fears, our worries, our concerns once and for all onto him. Are y'all following what I'm saying? Now, I can't just say, well, God, I cast all of my cares upon you. I ain't worried about it. That's part of it. Because, why do I do that? Because he cares for me, right? Right? So I cast my cares upon him because he cares for me. That means I don't have to worry about trying to make it happen. In his care for me, he'll fix it and make it work out, right? Okay. But the way he cares for me and make things right for me 
is through the instructions he gives me. Through the commands, through the leadings and promptings of the Holy Spirit, through the truth that he reveals by the Holy Spirit. And then my hearing and trusting in what he's saying and living by it and walking it out, that allows him then to manifest himself to me and on my behalf. That's true prosperity. When you have God manifesting his presence, his goodness in your life and on your behalf. Are you following me? So, you, so you're connecting the dots to how important humility plays in this. So a covenantous mind, a covenantous minded person is a prideful person, but a covenant minded person is a humble person. You see that? All right, now, so I got a statement. I got another statement for you. And this is kind of the same thing said a little simpler terms. Humility is essential to prosperity. Humility is essential to prosperity. And now I have, I have another statement that's kind of a follow-up statement to that. I don't know if I gave you this, but I don't know. But, but it says, there is nothing more humbling than sowing. There is nothing more humbling than sowing. And by sowing, I mean when you take of your substance... And, and use it to add to the welfare of another or to serve the interests of another as opposed to yourself. And as a result, you're depending on God to sustain you. There is nothing more humbling when you take what you have in your possession and use it in the interests of another, in serving another, in adding to another's welfare and well-being. Thereby depending on God to sustain you as opposed to what you have. There's nothing more humbling than sowing. Can you see that? Can, can, can you see? So, so in other words, if I'm going to humble myself under the mighty hand of God, then what matters to God needs to matter to me. What God loves, I then begin to love. What God hates, I then, I then must begin to hate. I can't tolerate and play with stuff that God hates or uh, that God calls evil. I can't play with certain lifestyle choices and decisions that people make and try to bring twist the word of God in it to bring it in on it to justify it. No, God calls it evil, so I got to call it evil. Are you understand what I'm saying? Amen. So, 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 by sowing a seed, I am taking of my substance and I'm using my substance in the interest of the welfare of another as, de as defined by God as opposed to using it to serve my own. And as a result of taking what's mine and serving God's interest, I am now depending on God to sustain me. That's humility. There's nothing more humbling than sowing a seed. It, because, see, that seed you sow, and when I say sowing a seed, I'm talking about... Obeying God is a seed. Your obedience is a seed. Disobedience is a seed. Are you what I'm saying? So the care God has for me comes in the form of instructions. And my obedience to the instructions is a seed that I'm sowing. And that's the demonstration and expression of my humbling myself. Of, 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 of my acknowledging God, your God, and what you say is final authority. And I'm going to live by what you say, even though the way it looks to me, it don't make sense, but you're saying it, so I'm going to go with it. You follow me? So I'm giving up the responsibility and the care of my life, and I'm putting it in your hands for you to take care of me, Lord. And so I'm going to trust you to take care of me, and I'm going to give myself fully to what you're telling me to do in terms of being a blessing to somebody else. Y'all see what I'm saying? Let, all right, all right, all right. Let, let, some, some, okay, read in your Bible. You want to talk about honor? Humility being honor and, 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 and holding God and another in greater reverence than, than yourself? Read in your Bible how David and his mighty men were in a tight spot and they had no water. And, and, and David didn't ask for water. It just, he just mentioned he was thirsty. And some of his men risked their lives to go behind enemy lines to bring him back some water. 
And then when he brought it to him, he said, I cannot drink this water. It's too precious because you risked your life to get it. And he poured it out. That's honor. See, see, you, you know, people get on me because I like cowboy movies. You see a lot of examples of honor in Westerns. You can, you, can, you can see a good old-fashioned Western, and you can see a group of soldiers in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a saloon cutting up, playing cards, and drinking, and they might fight over the last swallow of the whiskey in the bottle. But at the same time, that group of soldiers can be out in the desert trying to, 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 to defend a, a, a post, and they'll pass up the last drop of water for the next person, and the next person, and the next person. Y'all see what I'm saying? Look at your neighbor and tell him, said, 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 Westerns are holy. So anyway, oh, man. I, 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 you got to look at Genesis 26, 1 through 3, verses 12 through 16 and 26 through 29. But I'm going to end it right now with this last statement. And this statement is based on uh, Genesis 1 and 11, and, and, and it's supported by Psalm 37, 3 through 5, particularly in the Passion Translation. But, but this is what you got to get. Uh, you, you, must have, you must have confidence that your seed cannot fail, that it will actually produce a harvest after its own kind. That's Genesis 1 and 11. Every seed produces after its own kind, Right? Right? Now, here's the statement I want to give you. This is just something to see lie over. The lifestyle of humility, and by that we're talking about a person who cast his cares over onto God, is a reality in which the faith of a sower is connected to the faithfulness of God. Now, now I, 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 I came across that earlier today just spending time with the Lord, another man of God said it differently than that. But, but basically, I'm giving him credit for it because it inspired this. But think about it. We're talking about humility, right? How it's critical, right? It's critical to, to us being exalted by God. Amen. A life of humility before God is critical to us being exalted by God. So this is what that lifestyle of humility really consists of. It's simply the reality in which your faith as the sower has connected to the faithfulness of God. And so as he leads and commands you with what's in your hand, you can let it go because your faith is connected to his faithfulness. Amen? Praise God. Okay, so, so right now for those who desire, we'll worship in our giving, praise God, and tithes and offerings. Father, I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to give. I thank you for the privilege to give. I thank you for understanding that in giving, Lord, uh, it is given unto us. I thank you for helping us to understand that in sowing, Lord, we are reaping. I thank you for helping us to understand that it pays. It pays. It has great recompense of reward to support what you're doing in the earth, Lord. I thank you for helping us to understand that all that we have in our hands, all we possess, Lord, is given us by you. And of your own are we given back to you. And, and you look at it as worship and you reward us for it. And I thank you. So even tonight, as we sow, we do it bountifully. We reap bountifully. We approach this with a heart and an attitude of honor and reverence towards you, Lord. We take great joy and delight in it. We release our faith in it. And we thank you because of your faithfulness, money cometh. Whatever it takes, whatever we're in need of, it's coming. We'll have it in abundance. We'll have it on time. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Hallelujah. Praise God. Any questions about what we're talking about tonight? Any questions? Any, any praise reports or comments? I, 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 any, any other, I, I got a, I, re, I received a, uh, someone shared a very, very powerful praise report with me on Monday after the, after the moving and the, uh, and the way the Spirit of God was moving on Sunday. A person who had gotten up and walked through this altar, past this altar, 
they shared a testimony how it had been months. You know, every morning they get up, they're, they're racked with pain. You know, this has been going on for months, no energy, couldn't do this, couldn't do that. But Monday morning, after being here Sunday, got up with absolutely no pain, more energized than he had been in months, went to work out, doing things they hadn't been able to do. That's the goodness of our God and our Father. Amen? And so it's just all about, it's all about judging him faithful. Amen? If we judge him faithful, we'll receive the strength we need to be faithful to him. Amen? Amen. All right, let's stand to our feet. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the unfolding of your word tonight. We thank you for the revealing of the mysteries of the kingdom tonight, Lord. You said to us it is given to know the mysteries, the secrets of the kingdom. And to those of us who have, Lord, to have such understanding, more will be given us and we'll have more abundance. But you said to them that have not, even what they have will be taken from them. But I thank you, we're not the have-nots, Lord, but we are the have. We possess a growing uh, measure of understanding and revelation concerning how you do things, concerning who we are, concerning your faithfulness towards us. And even as we grow in our knowledge and understanding of who you are and the way you do things, we're following you, Lord. And our obedience and our service to you, it is our worship. It's a sweet fragrance before your nostrils. I pray that our lives, Father, not just public while we gather here, but privately when nobody's around, our lives, the totality of our lives, be a sweet, a sweet fragrance to your nostrils, that you're glorified and that you're pleased. And even as we honor you, Lord, you're faithful to honor us, and we thank you for that. So, Father, I just plead the blood of Jesus over this congregation, all who are here, all who are represented, all who may be joining us virtually. The good work you have begun, you are faithful to complete, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.